Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Laura Lovers and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for Cure Epilepsy. I wanna thank you all for joining us today. Approximately 30% of people with epilepsy have seizures that are considered refractory. In other words, they become resistant to current treatment options. Therefore, it's critical that new and improved anti-epileptic drugs continue to be developed. Today's webinar, entitled Synovimate, a new treatment option for partial onset or focal seizures, will spotlight one of the recently approved drugs for epilepsy. This webinar is supported in part by SK Life Science, and it's a part of Cure Epilepsy's 2021 Leaders in Research webinar series, where we highlight some of the critical research that's being done on epilepsy. As an additional resource, today's webinar, like all of our webinars, is being recorded for later viewing on the Cure Epilepsy website. You can now also download transcripts of all of our web webinars for reading. For over 20 years, Cure Epilepsy has raised more than $70 million to fund epilepsy research that supports our mission, which is to find a cure for epilepsy by promoting and funding patient-focused research. Cure Epilepsy provides grants that support novel research projects to advance the search for cures and more effective treatments. In 2020, we launched our Cure Epilepsy Catalyst Award to help accelerate the basic research we traditionally funded to the next stage of development and prepare potential new treatments for clinical trials. Today's webinar will provide an in-depth review of Synovimate, also known as Excopri, which is an FDA approved drug made available to patients last year. It is approved for the treatment of partial onset seizures and also referred, as, referred to as focal seizures. In this webinar, you'll learn what is known about synovimate and how it reduces seizure activity, why it is a safe and effective treatment for partial onset seizures. You'll also learn about the potential side effects that patients and caregivers should be aware of when considering this treatment option. Today's webinar is presented by Dr. Michael Sperling. Dr. Sperling is the Baldwin Keys Professor of Neurology and Vice Chairman of Clinical Affairs in the Department of Neurology at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He's also the Director of the Jefferson Comprehensive Epilepsy Center and the Clinical Neurophysiology Lab at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. His primary research interests include surgical treatment of epilepsy, mortality in epilepsy, epilepsy genetics, and clinical neurophysiology. Before Dr. Sperling begins, I'd like to encourage everyone to ask questions. You may submit your questions anytime during the presentation by typing them into the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your Zoom panel and then click send. I wanna thank those who submitted questions in advance of today's webinar. and We'll do our best to get through as many of those as we can. We do want this webinar to be as interactive and informative as possible. However, to respect everyone's privacy, we ask that you make your questions general and not specific to a loved one's epilepsy. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sperling. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be able to speak today. I'm going to be speaking about Synovimate, which is the brand name Excopri. Uh, it's the newest drug out to treat focal epilepsy, or what used to be called localization-related epilepsy for focal or partial seizures. And it's an interesting drug, and I've got a lot of information to tell you. So let's, let's move forward. Now, let, I'm gonna just start with a basic thing, because I'm not sure who's on this webinar and who's not, uh, just for a simple definition and to explain how drugs work. So what is an epileptic seizure and what is epilepsy? So a seizure, is when too many brain cells fire at once, or neurons, specifically those specific type of brain cells. Uh, so they have too many fire at the same time and, and too many fire. So you have excessive numbers of firing and excessive synchrony. This activity then can overshadow other brain functions and really override normal activity. And then the expression of the seizure really depends upon how much of the rest of the brain it takes over. So if it remains in a small area, you may just get a very minor subtle seizure for a focal seizure. For example, an aura where you get a funny feeling and nothing more. Or if it's in the motor area, maybe some jerking of the hand or the face or the foot, but nothing more. When it starts taking over more and more neurons throughout the brain, you get more dramatic manifestations. So it can start spreading uh, to involve other areas. You can get movements of 
both sides, when it spreads to both sides, typically you have some loss of awareness. And when it really has widespread, we get what's known as a focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizure or a secondarily generalized seizure, grand mole in the old terminology, where someone's unconscious and stiffened and shaking. So it, how much it does this makes a difference. And then a seizure, lastly, is a discrete episode. There's a clear time when it starts. And typically when it stops also, the continuous seizures or status epileptic, this is a pro separate problem. And then epilepsy is simply the tendency to have seizures. People who have inherent tendency in the brain to have seizures from whatever cause. So when we give drugs, we give drugs to prevent seizures. And we want, we want to do is block this excessive firing and this hypersynchronous firing of neurons. So too many firing to begin with, and then too many firing synchronously at once that can then override other activities. To block these seizures, we really look at multiple mechanisms. So if you think about it at the level of neurons, brain cells talking to each other, you can do it by modifying the flow of certain anions and cations across the cell membrane. So sodium, calcium, and potassium, and then chloride is the fourth one, are the major anions and cations that sort of are balanced in between and out. And when seizures occur and cells fire excessively, usually you've got an alteration in the firing of sodium and, ca and calcium in particular, and then others, other, other anions and cations may be affected as well. If you can block that or slow it down, then you won't get as many cells firing as much. There are receptors on the cells that react to transmitters, the little chemical signals from one cell to the next that can modify this flow of these anions and also produce other activity inside the cell that makes a difference. So you can modify the receptors on the cell surface. You can alter some of the internal processes. So for example, when one cell wants to send a message to another, it has to release a little packet of chemicals that diffuse across the gap between the two and cause the next cell to fire. One drug, or originally uh, paracetam, and then it has a couple of derivatives that have been used, levetiracetam or rivaracetam, actually modify the outflow of chemicals from one cell to the other so it can modify the way cells trigger others to fire. And you can also alter the strength of connection. And there are other mechanisms as well, but this is roughly how drugs are going to work. And we must uh, confess that we don't fully understand how they work. We have a, an idea, but our ideas need to be improved. So we prevent, we prevent seizures from occurring, and that's the purpose of giving medication. And there have been many medications prescribed over the past 160 years. And this is a graph uh, borrowed from uh, another person. It references at the bottom of the slide. Uh, it shows that the first drugs that were developed were developed in the 1850s. They were bromides, which is you know, basically a, a simple chemical. And then it was over 60 years to 1912 until phenobarbital was invented. Uh, so a long past it. And then you can see peraldehyde shortly after that. And then the early, uh, actually late 1930s and 1938, phenytoin, brand name Dutland, was developed, you see the zolomide. And you can see the number of drugs develops. And then really after 1990, there's been an explosion uh, with the number of drugs being approved to develop to treat epilepsy and try to prevent seizures. However, there's a problem. While we have a lot of drugs, till now, by and large, one drug is about as good as the others. So this phenytoin that was first developed in 1938, and carbamazepine for that matter in the 60s are as good, as effective as a lot of the drugs developed in the last decade or two. You know, the efficacy is not really different. They work about as well. Some drugs are better for some seizure types than others. So for generalized seizures, for example, divalproex, valproate, also known as Depakote as the brand, is particularly potent and better than all of the others. For absent seizures, ethosuximide, which was developed in the 1950s is still the best drug. We need new drugs for that too. So there are some differences, but for focal seizures, the drugs are mostly the same. There are a few that are subtly different than the others. Uh, and the main difference we have is between side effects. Different ones have different side effects and they also affect the body differently. So some drugs cause other drugs to be metabolized more or block the metabolism of other drugs and of other hormones in the body. Some drugs bind a lot to protein in the blood, others don't. So they can affect metabolism of hormones in your body and other chemicals differently, and the side effects are different. But the efficacy till now has not been terribly different. And why do we need that? So this is a graph that shows the effectiveness of drugs on blocking seizures. 
focal seizures in particular. So if you look at number one, that bar, it shows that about half of the people who are prescribed a drug have it actually work and stop seizures completely. Now, many of the remaining people may have the drug work somewhat. It may cut the number back a lot. It may make those seizures much milder, but they still may have some seizures. So you know, it would be nice if we had a drug that worked more than half the time. If you were going to get in your car to drive to work in the morning and you knew it would get you there half the time, you would very rapidly come up with a different mode of transportation. For treating seizures, this is what we have. So we need better drugs. And you can see if the first drug doesn't work, so if the half of people who it didn't stop further seizures, well, you buy help in about a third of the remaining people. So an additional 12, 13% of people will respond to drug number two to total. And if you think about it, 13%, uh, maybe 14% out of the remaining 50 is maybe a quarter, between a quarter and a half of the remaining people. The third drug, you, you get a little more benefit, but not very much. And you can see after that, they hardly really do very well at all, but the, the added benefit from adding more drugs is not great. And that's why we think about brain surgery once two drugs have failed, because once two drugs have failed, the odds of the next drug working and inducing permanent remission, meaning stopping seizures permanently, is very, very low. And the risk of surgery then becomes less than the risk of taking pills. It would be nice though, if we had additional medicines to use rather than uh, that, that were more effective. And then this is a slide that just shows the effect of new drug development on seizure control. So you can see that there are three lines that are superimposed. Drugs developed in 1982 to 91, 92 to 2001, and those developed after 2001. And it looks again at the proportion of people who become seizure free. So a probability of one looking at the uh, Y axis on that graph would be 100% of people seizure free. And this shows that you know, when we put people up in the first 12 months, a little over half are seizure free. Uh, and that's because some have had more than one drug at that point. But then if you follow along, it goes up and overall still maybe about 70% are seizure free in this, in this slide it shows. And you can see the response to drugs from the 80s, the 90s, or after that is about the same. So these new drugs are really not better by the evidence. They're not as effective as they should be and they need to be. Too many people have seizures despite appropriate treatment. So we're giving the right drugs. They're just not responding as the way, the way they should. The seizures are breaking through. And we do have other methods, as I mentioned. We can do surgery, which works nicely in many people and stops seizures. Neurostimulation, like responsive neurostimulation, deep brain stimulation or vagus nerve stimulation, which are palliative. They don't make seizures go away completely, but they can improve the situation for some people, for many people. And then some people, selected people, usually kids, can be treated with diet, ketogenic diet or modified Atkins. But we really need new drugs that are better to reduce the need for surgery in these other treatments. So Sinovimate was approved by the FDA in November 2019 and was finally released in May 2020. And the first question you might ask me is, why did it take nearly six months to come out? And that's because once the FDA approves it, the company and the FDA still have to negotiate on the label of the drug, what the writing is that goes out to doctors and pharmacists and patients. It takes time. The company has no idea exactly when the drug is going to be improved and they have no assurance of when it's going to be approved. So they have to ramp up manufacturing so they can have a, have a drug to do it. And then what SK Life Science, who makes this drug also did was they started working proactively in advance to start speaking with insurance companies so that when people like me wrote a prescription for people with epilepsy, the insurance companies would agree to pay for it because the drugs are unfortunately expensive and well beyond the means of the average person or even for a very well-to-do person, they're, they can be expensive. So this is one of the things that has to be done. We have to make sure that they're paid for. The drug has a similar structure to other drugs, Felbamate, which has been around since 1993, and then charisbamate was in testing, fell out of testing, and it's now going back into testing again. So it has a similar structure to those. And we know felbamate is a, is a potent drug, but it also is a drug that was a little scary, uh, and which is why it's hardly ever used. So we're hoping for a similar chemical compound that will work well or even better than felbamate, but not be quite as scary in terms of risk. This drug has a, a mechanism of action that seems to be different than other drugs. We only partly understand it. It alters the flow of sodium into neurons. So it changes the flow of sodium by doing something technically called an activation of sodium channels that reduces the excitation. The cells can't fire as, as readily. 
And also it modulates GABA-A receptors. And these are receptors that actually inhibit cell firing. So it blocks the excess of firing and it actually helps in, in two ways, one by blocking sodium and also just by affecting GABA. So it has two mechanisms that we're aware of. The drug looked very good. It's been subjected to two phase two trials. I'll give you the results of one of the trials. This is one in which 222 patients were randomized in the study. At 40 centers in the United States, India, Korea, and Poland. And nobody asked me why those countries in particular. I can explain the US because we are a big country and drug companies can make a nice profit in the United States. I can explain Korea because SK Life Science is owned by Samsung. So the people who make my phone also make this drug uh, and my television for that matter. Uh, India, I don't understand. And Poland, I don't understand. This is, this is what they selected. There are many places. And it's called a randomized controlled trial. So people were randomly, like the cost of a coin assigned to either get drug or placebo. And you can see of 285 patients in the graph on the right who were assessed for the study, 63 were excluded for various reasons. They didn't meet the formal criteria. 222 were randomized to about half getting drug and half getting placebo. And it's, it's like the toss of a coin, so it's not going to be precisely 111 each. It was 113 and 109. And then a couple of people drop out after that for whatever reasons they decide they change their mind, they don't want to participate, something comes up, they can. There's a four to eight week baseline, so you count seizures at that period of time, and then people were treated for 12 weeks. And you basically in these trials compare how often the seizures happen during the treatment phase with how often did they happen at baseline before the drug or placebo was administered? The average age of patients was 36 or 38 years old. Uh, they typically had seizures for about 20 years on average in history. It was roughly equal male to female. And because of the place where the study was done, 57 to 58% were Caucasian or white, 41 to 43% were Asian, and other races were minimally included. And in, this is an artifact. There's no reason to believe that a drug is less effective or more effective based upon ethnic background or race. There is reason to believe that the risk of an allergic reaction of some kind might be different. We know that some drugs like carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine uh, are more likely to cause a serious allergic reaction, a potentially life-threatening skin rash in people of East Asian and South Asian ancestry because of uh, certain genetic features there. So it would be nice to have more information which hopefully has been gathered. And then how often were these people having seizures? You had to have, I believe, four seizures a month to enter the trial. And the average was about seven and a half for people who were randomized to drug and five and a half per month who had placebo. And what happened to the change in seizure frequency? And as you can see, I have the three seizure types on this curve. So on the right, let's look at the right side. We'll, we'll do it uh, uh, right to left. The biggest, most severe seizures, the focal bilateral tonic clonic, the convulsive seizures were both eyes stiffened and shaken. There was a 77% reduction in seizure frequency. So the number of seizures was cut by three quarters in people who got drug. And you'll see there was a 33% reduction in people who got placebo, which is why we have to have placebo arms because people who get placebo still do better. Why? They're in a trial. Maybe they're more reliable with their drugs. Maybe they're counting seizures more carefully once they start to take it than before. I don't know. But there's a clear placebo response. And, and actually the placebo response was pretty high in this trial. We would like to normally see a placebo response in the 10 to 15% range. Uh, this raises some questions in my mind as to who was included, frankly. But nonetheless, a statistically significant difference. Uh, if you look in the middle columns, focal impaired awareness, what we call complex partial or psychomotor seizures, placebo patients had their seizure frequency or the rate per month dropped by 21%. People treated dropped by 55%. And then less severe seizures of people where people who are away, awake and don't lose awareness, but have some outward manifestation that we can see with the movement of one side or maybe freezing speech, smacking lips, whatever, 28% reduction in placebo arm and 76% in the treatment arm. So statistically significant, again, the drug worked. What was most striking is shown in the bar on the right. Again, we're going right to left. For those of you who read Hebrew or Arabic, this is natural. Uh, the percentage of patients who became seizure free for the 12 weeks, just for those 12 weeks, remember it's not long-term, this is a 12 week trial, but during that 12 weeks, you can see 8.8% of the people given placebo had no seizures once the trial started. 
28% of the people who got drunk did. So the absolute difference is 20% compared with the placebo arm. This is striking. This is striking. We've never seen something like this in trials before. This is the first trial that has shown such a striking effect with a high proportion of people stopping having seizures for that period of time. And we'll talk about longer time in a minute. So don't write questions, what about longer time? That's coming up. If you look in the middle, a greater than 90% reduction in seizures, you can see 8.8% versus 34%. So if you think about it, the drug was started at a low dose and ramped up actually over the first four weeks before they hit final dose. Some of those people who had seizures then stopped, but they might've had it in the first couple of weeks before they were in the therapeutic dose. They would have had a greater than 90% response. You can see still a big difference. And then at least a 75% response, less striking, but nonetheless statistically significant an improvement. Now, what are the side effects that we saw in, these, in this trial? And remember that trials are not the real world. Most people don't qualify for trials. You have to have a certain number of seizures per month. You can't have any active medical conditions. Uh, there are all sorts of things. They exclude people on certain kinds of drugs. It's very artificial. So it really is a very small group of people. And that's why we need to do bigger trials afterwards that are open to more people to really know what happens. If you have, for example, significant active liver problem or a kidney problem or a heart problem or a severe depression now, the companies don't want you in trials. You're excluded because they don't want people dying in their trials or attempting suicide if they're depressed and their drug potentially tainted with that. In the real world though, I have to treat people who have heart disease and depression and other things. And then I wind up not knowing you know, what the effect is in these conditions. So this is a problem with trials, just like small children are never included initially. And even in this first trial, you know, few children were included because again, they don't, they don't want to potentially cause problems in kids. But then when we have to prescribe the drug, we, we often wonder. And then later studies can do it. So the trial also is very artificial in that people are on a, their baseline drug or drugs, one or two or three drugs. And then this drug is added in. And in the trial, you can't change the other medication at all. So in the office, if you see me and I prescribe a new medicine for you, I will usually tell you, if you become unsteady or feel tired, I want you to lower the dose of this other drug you're taking by X amount. And I tell you that when I start the new drug, I said, I don't even want you to call me. I want you to know in advance what our plan is. I should have a plan and you should know it. I want to empower you. And those of you listening, when your doctor is starting on new medicine, they should also tell you what their idea is. What's their plan? If this happens or that happens, what is it? And that way you know what to do. You know, you know that the doctor has an idea, not call me and I'll decide. I should be able to decide when I start the drug what I'm going to do. And I should tell you so you know. And that way you don't have to worry. You feel it at eight o'clock at night. You're going to call. Will you get me? Will you get somebody else who knows what's going on? You know what to do. In a trial, we can't do that. If you have a problem, the drug still has to say the same. So the incidence of side effects is utterly meaningless in this trials for that reason, because we don't have adjustments. And it's also utterly meaningless for a second reason. And that is if you say that you were tired once for three minutes and report that, I report somnolence or tiredness as a side effect, even though it was three minutes out of 12 weeks. The person who's groggy and can barely stay awake the whole time is also registered as somnolent. So there's no qualification of, of what it means by this. And this is another problem as well, that we just, you know, you have to take all of this with a side effect. What we know is that sleepiness is with the most prominent, dizziness was most prominent. Is it from the drug or is it just from being on too many medicines at once? And it wouldn't have happened if we'd reduced it. No, I can tell you, I've had a few patients who were very sleepy and I lowered the drug dose of their other medicines substantially and they were still sleepy. And I'm convinced that Sonobamate can cause tiredness in some people and it can cause dizziness. And, and other things, and every other drug can as well. Uh, but in terms of how common it is, we don't really know because of the artificial design of trials. What were the serious side effects seen in this trial? Two patients on Sonobamate had a what was considered serious. They had a rash, which they recovered from, it was fine, and a urinary tract infection, which is probably completely unrelated. But if somebody has something in one arm of the trial, it's reported, if it turned out that 50 people had urinary tract infections on drug and none had it on placebo, we would say, aha, there's something wrong with this drug. It's associated with urinary tract. But if you see it in both or just one patient, it means nothing. And then it's interesting in the placebo, there were four serious side effects. Two patients had status epilepticus or uncontrolled seizures, had to be hospitalized. 
One doctor reported convulsion as a side effect. I don't know why. And one person developed chest pain, uh, maybe from the heart, had a coronary angiogram, undoubtedly had nothing to do with anything. In fact, this patient was on placebo, couldn't have had anything. And then there was one moderate side effect of rash as well. Um, so uh, what do we see here? Uh, we can see that on the right, you know, any side effect, 76% of people on Synovimate, 63% on placebo, it's hard to say, but again, the most common somnolence, dizziness. Headache was the same in both groups. Nausea was more common in synovimate. Fatigue, more common. Nystagmus is jerky eye movements. It's not even a side effect. People typically don't notice it. Balance disorder, unsteadiness, more common. This urinary tract infection, I think, has nothing to do with the drug. It's just random, random bad luck, just like respiratory infections, random bad luck is not significant. And tremor, some shaking is probably not significant. And then constipation and diarrhea on, on drugs. So maybe it, it, any drug can produce either, maybe that's real. So what are the conclusions? It's, it was really remarkably effective for the percent reduction in seizures and the fact that a, a number of patients just stopped having seizures in this trial. That's unusual. And in fact, it was so remarkably effective that when additional phase three studies needed to be done, the FDA said, you don't have to do a study to show it's effective. You have two phase twos, I just showed you one of them. Both are show remarkable effectiveness, but we're concerned about side effects. I'm going to talk about now you need to do more safety studies to make sure this drug is safe. So a significant proportion of opponents favorably, and it's a short-term trial. It was only 12 weeks. We want to look at long-term data, and I'll show you some, which is not yet published. But there was a safety signal. So overall, about 930 people in the early phases had some exposure to this drug, which could have been for a few days or a few months, as you can see. Three patients developed something called DRESS syndrome, drug reaction with the eosinophilia and systemic syndrome. So it's a reaction to the drug. It's like an allergic reaction. Eosinophils are a type of white blood cell that you see in allergy and systemic symptoms, typically fever, rash is the drug reaction and then uh, that we see. And often they can get inflammation in the liver or, or in other, other parts of the body. And of those three who had the dress reaction, one person died. Now, the one person died was actually someone who was a healthy volunteer who I can say, and uh, having seen the information, that I don't think was treated perhaps as ideally as he should have been. Uh, he had this reaction. Uh, he was treated at a at a drug trial site, not at an, at, an, at an institution like you'd go to with your doctors, where it's a doctor's office. I mean, these are, there are people who set up private labs where they do put people in trials, they do trials, and they have no great expertise in any one disease. They have expertise in treating trials. So this person was at a trial center, had a reaction, was given a low dose steroid, and sent home. Uh, had that person seen, I think, any of your doctors or me, we would have admitted that patient to the hospital given much higher dose steroid. And you know, we could wonder whether that person would have died or not. It's still possible, but I can tell you that I and, and my colleagues and, and your doctors too would have certainly treated this person differently. Uh, and, and we wouldn't let them go home. But nonetheless, it's scary. The dress typically develops two to eight weeks after starting treatment. Uh, we see this in a lot of drugs. So other drugs that many people take with epilepsy, lamotrigine is one of them that causes it, allopurinol, which is used for gout, and then acyclin, which is used for acne. And there are other drugs that can cause this. And, uh, and there are other serious drug reactions that happen with drugs too that we can see that I'll talk about. So, you know, is this drug riskier than the other drugs? I don't think we have enough information to be certain, but the answer is probably not. Uh, and in fact, felbamate, its cousin, is probably riskier. And I talked about the inflammatory reaction and the fact that it's potentially fatal and, and was fatal in one case. So the phase three trial was just looking at safety. So this was a little bit closer to the real world, but not fully close. You didn't have to have at least four seizures a month. You still have, nonetheless had to be healthy and you know, no active significant medical conditions. It's fine to have medical conditions. You can have high blood pressure or diabetes or whatever else under treatment, but it shouldn't be active and, you know, you know, and, and uh, posing major problem. Patients who have a, had a history of drug allergy were excluded from this trial. So we saw in the early signal uh, from, the, from the first 930 people, uh, 
three severe allergic reactions. This trial was then done that if you had an allergic reaction ever in the past, you weren't allowed. So now that the drug's approved, if you come to me with a history of drug allergy, I know your risk of allergy is higher to a new drug, whatever drug I give you when you're allergic to one drug. But immediately this trial became less useful for clinical practice in the long run, useful for the company in that less likely to have people with drug aller allergic reactions in this phase of trial and less likely to have serious reactions. So the drug would look a bit better. And from a safety point of view, since we know it has allergy, it makes sense for everybody's safety for the drug company to do this. They were being very responsible and making sure that people with a history of drug allergy didn't get in to lower the risk of having a serious allergic reaction in the trial. However, I in the real world now, and you in the real world, do have patients or do have drug allergies. And what do I do when you have that history? Do I, is it safe for me to give you this drug or not? I don't really know the answer with certainty. I know that when people are allergic, they're more likely to have allergies to new drugs that I start. We have to be especially cautious and watch. We wind up prescribing it anyway. We don't know how risky it is or isn't. And hopefully later trials will tell us. Now in the, the initial phase two is the drug was started either 50 or 100 milligrams a day and increased every week. So you started 100 milligrams a day for at least half the people. And then week two, you would be on 200, week three, maybe 300, week four, 400. Or you started at 50, then went to 100, 200, and, and up higher or not. Experts in immunology said that the way to prevent dress syndrome and other serious allergic reactions and drugs that are apt to produce this is start at a low dose and go up more slowly. You know, the pharmacologist at the company and the doctors, we can say how low, and the, the immunologist says, we don't know, you just have to give it a try. Uh, they chose the arbitrary dose of 12 and a half milligrams, a quarter of the lowest dose that had been used before. They had used 50, so they tried, and we know that 50, that were, there were rashes. Let's go down to 12.5, just like lamotrigine, a typical therapeutic dose is 100 or 200 or 300 or 500 milligrams a day. We start at 25. Let's start at 12 and a half milligrams, stay on that for two weeks, then go up to 25, stay on that for two weeks, then go up to 50 and stay on that for two weeks, and then go up to 100 and stay on that for two weeks. And what's the lowest effective dose? Probably around 100, although you might see some response even at lower doses, but really around 100 to 150 is where the drug starts working well. So by, you can see it takes three months to build up to what's a typical dose, 200 milligrams or, or, or 250 or pretty typical doses that people wind up taking on this drug. And it takes a few months to get to that. But what happened by doing that is that nobody got the bad rash. So we had 139 centers in 17 countries, North America. So US, Mexico, a bunch of countries in Europe, Asia and Australia. 1,339 patients, about equal males and females, 79% Caucasian, 3.5% Black, 5.5% Asian, quite different than the phase two trial I showed you, where 45% were Asian. Average epilepsy duration, 23 years. Everybody had uncontrolled epilepsy, and most, 82%, were taking two or three drugs when they enrolled in the trial, and then sinopamate was added. Uh, and you can see that you know, you know, various people came out for, for reasons of one kind or another, but for whatever reason, 1,339, and then other people came out because it wasn't helping or they had problems. And long-term, 1,078 stayed on the drug, which is pretty good. And that's sort of what you see in this slide. This is retention. So 100, zero to one, really 100% uh, as a fraction. And if you look at one year, you can see 0.79 or 79% of people were still on drug. We go out to two years and about 75% are still on drug. So this was uh, stopped a little bit before two years, but at two years, I can say it's about 75%. So it's again, remarkable. Why are people still on drug? Generally, because they like it. It's helping and they feel better, or at least they feel better on this drug. So this again is very good. It's a higher retention rate than we normally see for people to stay on it, they stay on it. And then what did we see for side effects? No dress syndrome at all. So starting it this way, nobody had it. Nine people out of 1,339. So less than 1% developed a rash, none life threatening, all rashes were stopped, resolved and went away when the drug was stopped. We saw, again, the most common side effects, sleepiness or somnolence, dizziness. And again, somebody could be developed somnolence 
they then called, we lower the drug sum, and then the somnolence goes away, but because they had it, it's still listed there. So it doesn't mean that 28% of people are somnolent on this drug. It means that 28% of people over the two years that they were in this trial, or more in some cases, reported somnolence at some point. And some people stayed up all night and they'd come in and say they were sleepy that day. And we still would report it because they were sleepy even though I stayed up all night and I would report it if this person was sleepy. And I don't think it's related to drug, but it's still reported. Again, fatigue, you can see some headache. Uh, and again, it doesn't mean they had headache all the time. It, it could have been once, it could have been, it could have been a lot. You just don't know when you look at this. Again, the psychiatric side effects, which are a matter of concern, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, about 2%, confusional state. I don't know why that's psychiatric. It's not necessarily 1.2%. And again, this doesn't mean all the time. It could be once or part of the time and easily adjusted. Three patients had suicide attempts. Uh, it's a shame that that happened. I don't know that we can blame it on the drug. If you follow over 1,000 people with epilepsy for a year, you're going to see uh, without any change in medications or thing, unfortunately, you'll see three suicide attempts easily as well. In fact, you may often see more than that. So it doesn't, there's no obvious data saying that it has a significant cause of psychiatric symptoms. It looks quite benign in that regard. And then this is the efficacy in a long-term study. So this is not yet published. I presented this information uh, at the American Epilepsy Society meeting, which was online in December, and we're working on the paper. And Dr. William Rosenfeld, a colleague of mine who's in St. Louis, really did the lion's share of the work on this and deserves this credit. Uh, I, I pushed heavily to have this done, and Dr. Rosenfeld did the leg work and a lot of the brain work, too, on this. And what you can see for each seizure type, and again, we'll go right to left, as, I, as, as we did before, for that people who had, uh, so out of the 1,339, we had 240 patients where we had good quality seizure data. Okay, so in a lot of patients, a lot, a lot of the doctors didn't carefully track how often they were having seizures before or after. At, at a number of sites, including ours, it was 10 sites, we had good data where we say we could confidently know what the effect was on seizures. And you see for the full convulsive seizures on the right, 28% of people became seizure-free, stopped having them. It's remarkable. A greater than 90% reduction in 48%. And then you can see 73, 78%, 75 or 50% reduction. So a great effect of 28% seizure-free. Focal impaired awareness or complex partial, 11% seizure-free. 31% had a more than 90% reduction and then less of a reduction, but still a good reduction in half to, to two thirds or to three quarters almost. And then the focal aware motor, you know, that aura where you also have some movement or difficulty with speech or swallowing or something, 14.8, so about 15% seizure free and a substantial proportion of patients, 85% had it reduced by half or more. So this is long-term average follow-up was 30 months, so two and a half years average follow-up. Again, a striking thing that I can put somebody on this drug and have a one in four shot that that person's gonna call me up and say, my seizure stopped for a year or two or three. Now, what will it mean over many years? I don't know. If we look at sort of efficacy, any consecutive 12 months, 36% of people, the bar on the right, had at least one 12 month period over that period of time where they had no seizures at all. And you can see 44%, uh, at least a three month seizure period, 35% had went six months or more without seizures. So again, a striking response for this drug. So rashes in general occur in five to 17% of drugs used to treat epilepsy. It's common. Some drugs are better than others. Levetiracetam, a uh, brand name Keppra, is a very good one for that. Rashes are very rare. Other drugs, the Lamotrigine is, uh, uh, carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, phenytoin, and phenobarbital in particular are common, commonly have rashes, maybe as many as you know, 15 or 17 percent. And serious skin reactions like DRESS, something called Stevens Johnson syndrome, TEN, which is toxic epidermal necrolysis, or Lyell syndrome, are, have been reported with all these drugs. I've seen it myself. Uh, and and there are at least eight other drugs if going through the literature carefully, which I did in preparation for this talk, that have also been reported to cause serious, potentially life-threatening drug reactions. So Sonovamate can do it too. Is it worse? We don't know yet. My suspicion is probably not, but I don't have the facts to back that up. I think the benefit will, is, makes it worthwhile giving it a try. 
for that reason, because the chances of it helping are so great and the benefit and the, and the risk that the risk, I think, is vastly outweighed by that. And for what it's worth, the way we presently dose it, no, nobody has had dress syndrome or these other serious syndromes. Now, sedovimate can interact with other medications, especially phenytoin. It can bump the phenytoin level up a bit. In, the, in one of the trials, the average level at the start of the trial was 11, and it went up to about 15 in the trial. In practice, in, a, in this long-term study where we could fiddle with drugs, we wound up lowering other drugs a lot, uh, but you may need to adjust it. And, and other types of side effects can occur with this drug, as with others. And, and how much of this is related to taking multiple medicines? How much would happen if you only took subnobinate by itself? We don't fully know. So I'll wrap up here. I ran a little over. I apologize, but we still have plenty of time for questions. It appears to be a really a remarkable new drug because of that ability to stop seizures completely in people that we haven't seen with others. Uh, typically, I'll comment also in trials, things look better than they do once they get out widely. And, and there's a phenomenon that's been seen that drugs look great in early trials, and the more you study them, the less impressive they look with time. This has remained impressive. We'll have to see how it works over the long run. I might be showing you the best of all possible worlds and maybe it'll settle out a bit lower, but it still looks great. It works differently than other drugs probably because we see these people stop having seizures that we haven't seen in other trials to, to this extent. But we know at least two points of attack, blocking sodium channels and also enhancing the vision with GABA receptors. It significantly reduces seizure frequency even when seizures are not stopped. And it also appears to make seizures milder. So you saw that response to the convulsive seizures was really terrific. So some of those people may have still had some seizures, but they were no longer having convulsive seizures, chronic seizures anymore. Its side effect profile in general looks like other anti-seizure medicine, and it seems to be well tolerated. The DRESS syndrome was in three of about 1,000 people prescribed this drug at starting doses of 50 or 100, who increased the dose quickly, and starting lower wasn't associated. But probably, I think if enough people get it, we will rarely see a serious drug reaction. Hopefully the risk will be incredibly low, uh, well under 1%, ideally under 0.1%. For the present study, we can say that it's going to be under 0.3% or less than 3 per thousand. And then people who start this medicine, obviously you need to know in advance what to expect and you should let your doctor know if there's a problem. So I have a system set up at Jefferson, for example, in Philadelphia where if somebody calls me at a reasonable time of day, not at 4.30 in the evening, I have a dermatologist who will see that person the same day. You call me at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and the dermatologist office closes at 4.30, you may have to wait till the next morning. You know, I can look at your rash, but I'm not a dermatologist. So I think you know, it's good to have something like this set up or to have, you know, many people have their own dermatologists who can look at it. Many of my patients use their cell phones, they take a picture, they send me a message through their, uh, electronic medical record of it, I can then forward that to the dermatologist who can look at the photo. The dermatologist said that some of the photos are good enough that they can tell and some are not. It's hard for them to know. But uh, it, it's more the technical, you know, the phones are generally good enough. It's, you know, did you have good lighting uh, is, is more of the issue. Uh, so you want to pay attention and, and let people know and, and, and I think be optimistic. And I will end here. Thank you very much. Terrific, Dr. Sperling. Thank you so much for that incredibly informative presentation. I know a lot of questions have already been addressed, um, but we will now uh, start the Q&A session. So if uh, audience members have questions, please go ahead and submit them in the Q&A tab located at the bottom of the Zoom panel and click send. So we will start digging into some of these questions. <clears throat> so um, a couple of questions have come up regarding different types of epilepsy that might be used to uh, Sonovamate may be used to treat. For example, is this medication suitable for occipital lobe epilepsy? Good question. It is approved and has been studied in all the focal epilepsies. So if you have occipital or parietal or frontal or temporal, it's perfectly, you know, the evidence exists that it works for focal epilepsy and occipital is a focal epilepsy. Is it good for generalized epilepsy if you have lennox gastaut syndrome, for example? or Dravet syndrome? Is it good if you have an idiopathic generalized epilepsy like juvenile myoclonic epilepsy or childhood absence epilepsy or juvenile absence or just generalized epilepsy with tonic clonic seizures? Not been studied in that. Studies need to be done. Okay. There was a similar question. Somebody is asking about um, frontal lobe epilepsy. So I- Yeah, frontal lobe that. epilepsy is a focal epilepsy. Absolutely appropriate. 
Okay. What other medications are good to be paired with Sonovamate? I am not a huge fan of pairing medicines. I do it more than I should, as do many doctors. But in the best of all possible worlds, you would be on only one drug because then you have less side effects. If you're going to pair it, however, drugs that work via a similar mechanism are probably not ideal because you're more likely to get side effects. So if you take a drug that's a sodium channel blocker already, and then a new drug is added, which also blocks sodium channels, you're more likely to have side effects. So that's, you have to discuss with your doctors, which are, you know, what's suitable for what you have, but sodium channel blocking drugs like uh, Lacosamide, brand name Vimpat, Carbamazepine, which is Tegretol, Octarbazepine, Trileptol, um, and, and, and some others, Lamotrigine, uh, also Lamictal brand name, are sodium channel blockers. When you add Sonomamate in, you're more likely to get side effects. Now you can pair it, but I routinely have people start lowering their other drugs somewhat, usually by the, when they're going to start at 50 or 100 milligrams a day, depending on how much they're taking. Uh, just start lowering the other drug to try to block side effects. And I tell them, if you start seeing side effects, you can start lowering this sooner. You know, drugs with a different mechanism of action, so levetiracetam or Keppra, or Griferacetam or Griviac, uh, Parampanil, which is Ficampa, very differently, you're, you're probably going to be a bit less likely. Now, there haven't, you know, there haven't been great studies on that. Some analyses have been done uh, looking at side effects, and there, there have been some formal studies. But that's a general rule that one can follow. And the details of studies are almost irrelevant in some sense because it's the dose that you're on that makes the difference more than anything. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> um, you've mentioned Felbamate, uh, and, and the, this is a possibly viewed as a newer version of Felbamate. But how does the effectiveness of Sinovamate um, compare to Felbamate? Felbamate was studied in Lennox Gastaut syndrome. So there aren't the formal studies of focal epilepsy, so we can't really compare it quite as well. Now, many people, myself included, used it in focal epilepsy somewhat, but then Felbamate was discovered to cause potentially you know, fatal liver reactions and bone marrow reactions with people who became profoundly anemic within a year of its appearance. So people use it very infrequently these days, and, and mostly it's used in Lennox Gasto, so we don't, have a, we don't have a good idea. We all thought that Felbamate was a strikingly effective agent, however. Okay, okay. So uh, just to clarify, um, you mentioned the issues with felbamate and liver toxicity. There is no worry about uh, sonobamate and liver toxicity in this case. So uh, you, can, you can do the numbers 930 plus 1339. So we have over 30, uh, uh, over 2200 people. And there's been no abnormalities, significant abnormalities of liver reported with this. Does that mean that a less rare or less common reaction might not happen, it's possible. So felbamate in the trials looked safe for liver also. It wasn't until it started being prescribed that it was that liver problems uh, resulted. Uh, so keep in mind that when you start a new drug that just came out, we have reasonable evidence about it being effective. We have really modest evidence about safety. There's nothing gross and horrible, but you know, if, if, if one person out of 5,000 has a serious liver reaction or a serious bone marrow reaction, you have to have 25,000 people get the drug before you can be reasonably confident that the rate is at least one in 5,000. If the rate's one in 50,000, a quarter of a million people have to have it. And, and when drugs are approved after only 2,000 or 3,000 have had it, you know, we know the risk is not large, it's gonna be small, but it, it doesn't mean that there couldn't still be a one in 1,000 or one in 5,000 or one in 10,000. Uh, reaction. Uh, so, you know, time will tell. Uh, we don't routinely order liver function tests when starting people on this drug. We just ask them how they feel and keep an eye on things. We don't order any blood tests uh, with regularity uh, because it's not clear that the blood tests really predict it. And if you have this strange, what's known as an idiosyncratic reaction, there's no evidence that monitoring in advance actually makes a difference. It's the, the body is exposed to it. Something happens and whether you take it for an extra one day or seven days probably doesn't make a difference. What's going to be is going to be at that point. And it's when people don't feel well that then we have to investigate and look. Great, thank you. Uh, in terms of metabolic pathways, does Sonovamate share a pathway with CBD? We know a lot of people are on CBD, um, whether it's the approved version, the, the FDA approved version, or um, uh, 
medications that are or, or substances that are purchased um, over you know dispens at dispensaries. Um, how is there any interaction, known interaction with CBD? Okay, so excellent question, and you know, a lot of people are taking it. Uh, uh, and CBD and, and products that contain CBD as medical marijuana has many chemicals, one of which is presumably CBD. The enzymes in the liver that metabolize synovamate also will metabolize CBD and other marijuana constituent chemicals. Uh, does uh, synovamate inter, you know, alter the metabolism of CBD? Uh, synovamate does inhibit one of the enzymes within the liver that helps metabolize some compounds, it's a 2C19 compound, there's a potential for an effect on that. Uh, you know, how significant is it? We don't know. And there really haven't been great studies in people. Uh, uh, so in, in all those studies that were done, there's not a whole lot of measurement of CBD that we can know. And this is one of the things that needs to be studied. I'm sure there'll be data that's out there. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a paper or two published that I haven't noticed yet uh, addressing this. In practice, we start a new drug and if there's side effects that start to develop, it's common to start lowering other, other drugs and other medications. Again, for focal epilepsy, I would point out that there is no scientific evidence in humans that CBD has benefit, okay? So there's no data. People can try it. And I have many patients who give it a try. So give it a try, see if it helps, but there's actually no scientific data that it works. Uh, so, you know, What's the effect in, you know, on CBD in, in, in people with focal epilepsy who have this drug is, I think, still needs further information and, and you know, large tail crossing of people because they're not just on CBD, they're on usually one or two other drugs or sometimes three other drugs. And it's the whole mixture, the gamish that we need to understand. So adding one more drug into the, into the mix may not make, you know, may not enlighten us as much as we'd like. Um. Do you know if there are any studies on tuberous sclerosis and synovamate, or if there's anything in the works? Uh, so, so many seizures and tuberous sclerosis are focal. So I would expect that for focal seizures and tuberous sclerosis, this will be beneficial. Uh, I'm, I don't think there are any formal randomized controlled trials like I showed you, or even, but I, I'm certain that some people in tuberous sclerosis centers are starting to use this drug and tracking how their patients are doing. So I, I would expect that we'll see some results relatively soon. Great. Um, an interesting question here around other types of drugs in, common, in, in interactions. Are there any reactions with warfarin or Coumadin? Uh, none that have been significantly, that, that's been reported to date. So I would still be cautious in the sense of checking the INR uh, in people on, on, on warfarin when starting any, any new drug that hasn't that's can interact with liver enzymes because you can always be unpleasantly surprised and, and I would hope that most of the time we would be pleasantly surprised that it shouldn't make a difference with warfarin but it, it, it's one of those things we want to keep an eye on. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you have any recommendations for patient compliance in a digital world where there are virtual visits? I'm not sure I understand the question uh, for digital compliance. For compliance, I think encouraging compliance. Um, yeah, well, so, sure. I mean, for encouraging compliance, uh, we we talk to each other and we can talk to each other, you know, through computers or phones, which is how most of my patient visits are done during the pandemic. Uh, the vast majority are, are done that way, and, and I think it's the same conversation we have. You know, one of the things that we as doctors have to do is understand our patients' motivations. In my experience, the main reason people, there are three main reasons people don't take their drugs. The most common is it bothers them. They have side effects from it, so they'll skip a dose now and then because they don't feel well. And if doctors don't ask about that, we don't know, and then we don't adjust. Or if you don't tell me that you know, you're skipping it every now and then because it bothers you because you don't want to disappoint me, you're not disappointing me. I want to know if you're having a problem. Let me know. I'll adjust your doses. We want you to feel well. The idea is to take the pill, but otherwise not notice that it's there. So in my experience, I think a lot of it has to do with the drugs cause people not to feel well, and they don't want to embarrass their doctors by making them feel bad that I gave you a drug that makes you feel bad. It's fine. I won't, I won't feel bad. I want you to feel well. Tell me. That's one reason. The second reason, unfortunately, is affordability. 
often. We live in a, you know, in, in practically the only advanced country in the world, modern, you know, advanced economy, I should say, in lots of countries, but advanced economy, uh, where you know, healthcare and drugs aren't covered as part of it. And drugs can be very expensive. And insurance companies have learned that your copay can be $10 a month with a generic and they can make it 200 a month or 100 a month if you're on brand. And if drugs are on brand, suddenly it's too expensive and people wind up skipping doses or taking less than they should. So cost makes a difference. Again, have a conversation with a doctor if it's too expensive. Uh, you need to be on a different drug. Some of the companies, this company that makes this drug as well, have programs to provide drug for free for people who have certain income, income qualifications who, who otherwise couldn't afford it. Uh, we need we need our, our health system fixed where people with chronic conditions don't have to pay money to take drugs. Right now, you know, I have patients who are on uh, atorvastatin, Lipitor, for cholesterol lowering. If you're on a generic, there's no copay at all. If you have epilepsy, you really shouldn't have a copay. And you should there should be no barrier. So that's the barrier. The third barrier, which I've been guilty of too, is every once in a while people forget. Right? We all forget. You know, we stay up late. We're out late in the pre-pandemic world more than now. <laughs> but we're out late, we're doing something, and we go to bed and we forget our medicine. We wake up in the morning, we're rushing, we're late for work, we have to go somewhere, we forget our medicine. That, you can try to do something about, I always encourage people to brush their teeth twice a day and keep your medicine with your toothbrush, next to the toothbrush. It's there in the morning, it's there at night, if you're doing it once a day or twice a day. Uh, set an alarm on your phone to ring. Uh, and, and two alarms, one, if you're supposed to take your medicine at 10 o'clock at night, have it ring at 10 and then have it ring at five after 10 to nag you. You'll get in the habit and then you won't need the alarm anymore. It just becomes automatic. So there are a few, a few techniques that can be done. And, and, and most importantly, frankly, is to make sure that the drug doesn't bother you. It's excellent advice. It's excellent advice. We have a tremendous number of questions that have come in, um, more than we can possibly handle in this, this hour long webinar. So what I would like to do is, um, is uh, ask Dr. Sperling, perhaps he could consider answering some questions. We'll also uh, perhaps reach out to others who could also address, I'm looking at something like 50 questions uh, in the queue. Um, so this was clearly a very compelling uh, and, and a very exciting opportunity for um, our community to learn about uh, this new um, medication that is now available that looks very, very promising uh, in the trials that have been performed so far. And we'll certainly learn more as it gets uh, into uh, the epilepsy community as a treatment. Uh, so Dr. Sperling, I wanna thank you for your presentation. It was incredibly informative uh, and your um, your your uh, ability to answer such great questions. Um, I also want to thank uh, SK Life Science for, for providing support for today's webinar. And of course, uh, our audience for the incredible engagement that we have seen. So if you have additional questions, please do forward them on. We will do our best to address them. Um, if you would like to uh, recommend any uh, future webinar topics, uh, we are always interested in hearing your thoughts on what you would like to learn. Um, and if you also want to learn about more of Cure Epilepsy's research programs or their future webinars, please visit our website or our email address at research at cureepilepsy.org. Please also be sure to register for our next webinar on February 8th at 11 a.m. Central Time, which will recognize International Epilepsy Day. The webinar is, is entitled International Disparities in Epilepsy Care, Social and Economic Effects of Epilepsy in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it will be presented by Dr. Gretchen Burbeck while she is on her way to her research location in Zambia, East Africa. So thank you again to all. Uh, see you at our next webinar.